All right, so as was alluded to, I work at the Andrews Institute in Gulf Breeze, Florida. I did my fellowship under Dr. LaProd and Dr. Stedman in 2011 to 12, and then started practicing in this area in 2012 with Dr. Andrews as my main mentor at my location. When we think about the idea of ACL repair and, and a synthetic scaffold, we need to break those two apart in order to fully understand them. ACL repair is something that uh, we predominantly abandoned in the mid-1990s, but at that time we were predominantly doing it in an open approach augmented with a lateral procedure. There's been renewed interest in the last decade, our reasons being the advancement in our arthroscopic techniques and our emergence of biologics with the thought that if we combine the two, we can improve in this space. There's been some promising short and midterm results by the developers. And when you think about this space, we oftentimes get taught first by the developers who may have some skin in the game and may have some disclosures to consider. But there's been more variable results with the early adopters. And I would say that most of the people in this room are the early adopters. That's ultimately where the rubber meets the road. One thing we've learned looking back at the literature is there's risk factors for failures of ACL repair, and they include younger aged patients. They include high pre-injury sports activity levels. They include mid-substance ruptures, and they include impaired integrity of the ACL bundles or the synovial sheath. And I would argue that this may be a large predominance of what we see in our clinics. For a full review, look at this article from, the, from uh, Hutz et al., Journal of Clinical Medicines in 2021. Similarly, we need to consider synthetics and their history independently as well. Their history of synthetics really heated up in the mid-1980s, initially as a replacement to grafts and then later as an augmentation in the graft. So if we look back to that history, we can learn something along these thoughts. Initial enthusiasm was also later tempered by reports of complications. So again, we had the, uh, the inventors compared to the early adopters. There were concerns about device creep and failure, non-infectious knee effusion and synovitis, accumulation of synthetic materials within the knee, and premature development of osteoarthritis. The Gore-Tex and the Dacron were withdrawn from the market in the early 1990s, and the LAD was withdrawn from the market in the United States in 2000. This systematic review from 2015 from arthroscopy is an excellent review on this subject. Considering that review, I want to show you all the devices and their history on one slide for consideration. So here I have the brand name to the left, the material in the middle of the slide, and then their failures and effusion rates to the right. One thing just to consider is that many of these substances are what we are considering with our internal brace technology. So I'd like you just to consider that. So the failure rates were as high as 33% down to 2.6% with the large ligament. Effusion rates were also variable, the highest being the Gore-Tex at 27.6%, and the lowest being the, the leads, and also the large was relatively low. However, in 2019, a single surgeon who was an early adopter reported his long-term results and reported a 33% failure rate and an effusion rate of 5%. Also, when you consider these materials, look, you'll see polyester and polypropylene ethylene, and that's also many times what we are considering with these newer technologies as well. This is the internal brace is a braided polyethylene and polyester suture, and we don't have any long-term data on it yet. With that being considered, this internal brace technology has been developed with some preclinical study as well as some biomechanical study as well. The preclinical study is always the base of our pyramid of evidence. The articular capability was studied in an animal model. This was a canine model involving six canines. Initial study was published in 2019. And what they did was they implanted it alongside of an ACL. And in one group, they also severed the connection of not the ACL, but just the internal brace. What they reported was arthroscopy at four to six months then sacrificed the animals at six months and looked for synovial change. The histology at six months suggested mild to no synovitis. So that was not no no synovitis, that was no to mild synovitis. Here's the group with the, F, the internal brace intact compared to transected. The intact was higher in synovial rating than the, than the resected. They also had a BTB model at that time for comparison and their conclusion was that these braces were lower than a BTB simulated model. After that, they've also done many studies looking at how strong the constructs can be when you look at them in the cadaver lag. 
And this has biomechanically validated these constructs. Hats off to Cohen and his team at, at one of our industry partners. Initially, they were looking at constructs without the internal brace. So to the left of this screen, you'll see a fixed repair without an internal brace, and then an adjustable loop system without an internal brace. And you can see the gap formation to the left is higher than if you add an internal brace. So here's the ACL repair with an internal brace that was a fixed loop construct compared to an adjustable loop construct. And their conclusion was that an adjustable repair construct that you can tension and retension with an internal brace is the strongest repair construct. Lowest gap formation and the highest load bearing capacity. The clinical study, now you always need to think about the developers, those are the first steps, and contrast them to the early adopters, they're the second steps. Gordon McKay published his first series in 2015. He had an average age of 34. One year follow-up, a case series with a 1.5% failure rate. He then published in 2019 a follow-up study. He had lost some of the N, and the re-rupture rate was 4.2%. The early adopters are the second steps. In, 2007, in 2019, this was a very young cohort published in AJSM, average age 14, 22. They compared it to reconstruction. The re-rupture rate of the repairs was 48.8% compared to 4%. In 2020, a cohort study was published, average age 33, 24, they did not report the re-rupture rate. Since that time, there are three case series that have been published. And one thing to consider is that as you look at the age of the cohorts, it seems that the age is correlative of the re-rupture rate. So this may not be a good option for our younger patients because the younger patients are going to test their ACL a little bit more than the older patients. Another thing that's been considered is the bare implant, this bridge-enhanced xenograft collagen scaffold. Martha Murray in 2019 published a cohort study looking at average age 24, 10 subjects, at two years with a 0% re-rupture rate. She then in 2020 in AGSM published a randomized controlled trial in 100 subjects, average age 17. The re-rupture rate was 14% in the bear group and 6% in the control group. So these second steps are what we really need to keep our eyes on because the early adopters are really where the rubber meets the road to know what you can trust and can't trust. So in conclusion, the history of synthetics sits hard on the gut, if you will. I think that the suture augmentation idea has a promising profile in a canine model of six canines and the biomechanical development is optimizing but the ACL repair still requires deliberate patient circulation, and we also need to always consider the excitement of the early adopters, needs to, or the, of the developers, needs to be tempered by the clinical results of the early adopters. And we always await the next round of optimized results, consider the pyramid of evidence, and I live in Florida, although I live in Florida on the water, this is a bear drinking out of my daughter's kiddie pool. And so I'm gonna keep a close eye on that bear, and I think we should probably keep a close eye on ACL repair too. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr.